Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this next session. In fact, the final session of this week's European Sustainable Energy Week. All about the role of taxation in bringing about energy autonomy for the EU, whilst, of course, achieving decarbonisation. My name is Maeve McMahon. I'm a journalist with Euronews. And I'm delighted to be here with you today, physically, for this discussion brought to you by four DGs of the European Commission. DG Taxot, responsible, of course, for Taxation and Customs Union. DG Employment, responsible for Jobs, Social Affairs and Inclusion. DG Ener, responsible for Energy. And DG Envy, responsible for the Environment. And the objective of today's panel is crystal clear. It's to hear how taxation can contribute to the EU's energy autonomy and the EU Green Deal. At a time of rising energy prices and the need to reduce the EU's energy dependency, there's a real need for fresh ideas. Fresh ideas that will fly among 23 very different EU member states. So that's why I'm thrilled to have four stellar speakers right up here with me this afternoon to give you some food for thought on all that. And as you probably know, the EU Energy Taxation Directive hasn't been updated since 2003. It's currently under a major review, so this discussion is of huge importance. And all the ideas that we hear today will also be feeding into the High Level Tax Symposium, taking place on the 28th of November. It's called On the Road to 2050, a mix for the future. So save that date, the 28th of November. But for now, let's say hello to our four speakers. On my left here, Gerasimos Thomas. He's the Director General of Taxation and Customs Union. So good afternoon to you. Welcome. We're also joined by Kurt van Dender. He's the Head of Tax and Environment Unit at the OECD's Centre for Tax and Administration. Good afternoon. We're also joined by Femke Krutus. She's the founder and the president of the EX Tax Project. That's a think tank focused on the transformation of fiscal systems to promote jobs and sustainable growth. Welcome. And last but not least, we're joined by Christian Valenduc. He's a professor here in Belgium at the University of Louvain-la-Neuve. So thank you so much to you as well for being here. We're also joined by many of you this afternoon online, over 700, I believe. So a very warm welcome to you. You can interact with us by using social media. The hashtag today and all week is EUSEW2022. So please share your comments and your remarks there. And for those in the room, hello, and also those online, you can use Slido. I'm sure you've heard about it before, but start getting it out now because we're going to use it already because I'm going to put two questions to our audience to get your thoughts first. So to use Slido, you can use, panelists, you can do it as well if you have your phones in front of you. You can go to slido.com or you can just scan your mobile phone here, just stick it up to the screens there and you'll be able to access Slido very, very easily. And when you get on Slido, Slido you need to make sure that you're in the Manslot room because that's the room that we're broadcasting tonight or today from. So if everyone's on Slido, we can kick off um, with the first question, right, for our viewers, because of course we want to get your thoughts and we want to have your questions as well as this session goes on. So the first question for you all today is, how much do you think that taxation can help in delivering the EU's climate goals on a scale of one to five, where five is a lot and one is not at all? Oh, wow. Pretty clear answer there, 100%. <laughs> so we can move swiftly on. Oh, it's still moving. Okay. Say it again. Okay. Any reaction there to that? Our panelists? To the Slido? Briefly? I think we can agree with that. Uh, it's in the top range. Yes. Great. Now, on the second question for you all today, in a few words, what should change in today's tax policies or tax mix in order to better meet the EU climate and energy goals? So what should change in a few words? To help the EU meet its climate and energy goals, what should change? Panelists can also write it down as well if you want. 
on a pen with a pen. Increased taxes, fiscal power for the EU, carbon tax, wealth tax. Okay, great ideas there coming from our audience. Thank you so much for those. And as I said, you'll have a chance as well to put questions to our panelists a little bit later. But now we can move on and get some insights from the four of you on our first question this afternoon, which is how can taxation contribute to one, improving energy savings, two, the diversification of energy supplies, and three, the big topic this year, which is, of course, the acceleration towards renewables. Gerasimus, I was going to start with you, if you're comfortable with that, and if not, yeah, you want to tackle that question? Gerasimus Thomas there, the Director General of Taxation and Customs Union. Thank you. As uh, we can see, there is a quite uh, a substantial consensus that taxation can play uh, a role in this energy transition. And, uh, uh, and as you said in your introduction, our energy taxation framework is very old. Now, uh, this does not give the full picture. We have uh, uh, here in the EU, when we talk about energy taxation, uh, we established minimum levels that were established quite a long time ago, 20 years ago. And uh, what we see is that uh, uh, many member states individually, they have been much more active and much more ambitious. So um, while uh, there are many areas where the member states individually have uh, adapted their taxation systems to help the energy transition, uh, this is good, uh, but it obviously creates problems in our single market as we move collectively into better targets. And that is the, the why this is the good moment to revise the minimum of the energy taxations that we have and change the structure of the system. So uh, our energy taxation directive that put on the, we put uh, on the table last year as part of the Fit for 55 package tries to increase the minima that we have on fossil fuels, tries to encourage electrification by reducing the minima for taxation for electricity. So it creates a system with priorities. You tax electricity less in simple terms, and you tax fossil fuels much more. And this is a transformation that will take uh, follow a, a, a period of 10 years. And in between, of course, you have different other sources of energy, biofuels, etc. As we need a lot of electricity, not only as a result of the, re of, of the war, but also uh, driven by our use to change our cars, to electromobility, etc. We give the opportunity also to have, to have zero taxation for electricity in certain cases. And I think that is important, uh, uh, let's say, component of the strategy to incentivize green, greener taxation and incentivize investments in greener taxation. Um, we have uh, uh, another aspect, which is transparency. Uh, this is a general problem in our uh, tax system, not only in energy taxation, that uh, between member states there are different taxes and they are not always transparent. They have exceptions for one thing, exceptions for another thing. So both investment but also consumers, they struggle, you know, when uh, they have to deal with uh, businesses, SMEs with different countries. So I think it is important in this uh, uh, new environment not only to structure the taxation for energy in a way that supports uh, uh, the, you know, the Green Deal and uh, uh, the transformation of our energy sector, uh, but also in a way that it is uh, uh, more transparent and av avoid too many exceptions. Now, you will say we have a war. How about now the short term? How about this winter? Uh, you know that it is coming up. Uh, how can we tax more uh, the fossil fuels when we are moving out of gas into coal and uh, so there is uh, in the short term we have uh, deployed other measures you must have heard on the uh, revenue cap or the solidarity contributions for the fossil fossil fuel fuel sector so we do have and we can expand later on on some short term uh, next winter measures that uh, help uh, get through this winter through the crisis but i think it is important to keep in mind uh, the long-term goal, which is the only way forward to repower uh, our continent in a more uh, Green Deal friendly way, and then taxation can make a contribution. It's not the only factor, uh, but it can substantially help drive business incentives. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rasmus Thomas, for those <coughs> opening remarks from yourself. I'd like to bring in the perspective then from the OECD and straight over to yourself, Kurt van Dender, for your perspective on that first question. Thanks very much. So, um, indeed, um, I mean, already repeating some of the points, um, tax is an important instrument for reaching environment climate goals, energy security goals as well um, um, in, the, in, in the energy sector. Why is that so? Well, we have supply and demand, which depends on prices. Prices depend on taxes and on other instruments, so we can influence um, um, uh, prices and therefore affect supply and demand. That's the basic principle. Um, how well does this work? Well, this, depend on, this depends on how strongly supply and demand respond to price changes. That's a question of what are the elasticities which are at play. In the long run, these elasticities are quite significant, which means that tax works well. You can get real results by using tax uh, in, in terms of uh, getting to where you want to get in terms of uh, energy security, pollution, uh, climate, climate goals. Um, in the short run, it's a different matter. In the short run, in the very short run, elasticities are very low. Um, they are particularly low in the current context, uh, seeing the supply conditions and where demand is. So working through tax price at this stage uh, is going to be slightly uh, less effective, even much less effective. So that's what tax can do. We can use tax for climate and environmental goals. We have to keep in mind that tax is also there for revenue goals. Uh, fossil fuel tax base, 2.5% worth of GDP of revenue roughly in, in EU countries. So that's significant. That's the very quick background. That's what we can do. What do we do at the OECD? We try to measure what countries actually do in terms of using all these instruments. Uh, in quite a lot of detail, and now for 71 countries, more than 80% of CO2 uh, emissions from, from energy use uh, across the world, 71 countries, OECD, G20, and an increasing number of uh, developing and emerging uh, economies. Um, new report, which I want to plug here, that will come out on the 5th of October, which will have the full detail on all these 71 countries. What do we see? We spoke, um, uh, the first speaker spoke about the goals. We speak about the goals. We look at the current situation, alignment of taxation, energy taxation with, uh, uh, with all these goals is not so good. There's a lot of room for progress for reform and some of the reforms which are being discussed in the context of, of the ETT clearly go uh, in, in that direction. What do we see, for example? Very low taxes on coal, the most polluting fuel, the most carbon-intensive fuel. We see in the transport sector petrol-diesel tax gaps, which are, from an environmental point of view, usually not very logical. Progress has been made, including in a couple of European countries, to try to equalize it, but it remains a problem in, in a lot of places where diesel is, is advantaged for reasons which again, from an environment climate point of view, are not that sensible, and which from a revenue raising point of view are perhaps not the biggest issue. In intersectoral differences, relatively high taxes in transport, at least in European countries, not in other, other, other sectors. That creates an imbalance potentially in terms of, of uh, abatement costs. Electricity taxes were mentioned. If you want to uh, electrify the economy, which seems a sensible strategy, then um, taxing carbon intensive, dirty input fuels for electricity generation might make more sense than taxing the electricity outputs itself. Lastly, there are the inter country differences. Um, Europe tends to make much more use of energy taxes, both for environmental goals and for revenue goals than other parts of the OECD, other parts of the world. Larger differences, um, you may know that the last time the uh, fuel tax uh, in the transport sector in the USA was increased was in 1993. So they're still at a nominal level of 1993 in the USA. That's a clear example of a different approach to uh, working with taxation as, as a policy tool. Differences are large, the differences are increasing. That's what we also see in our data. The places where carbon prices, energy taxes are already relatively high, 
these are the places where these taxes and prices are further increasing. And that is, of course, something that over time, as ambition, climate ambition uh, is elevated, can create a problem in terms of leakage. And that's what the Commission is also trying to uh, address through the CBAM. So that's a clear evolution. Differential reliance on how countries go about climate policy. The USA, as you know, Inflation Reduction Act, it's also about tax, but it's about tax incentives. Not about pricing, but about tax incentives. So that's kind of the big background uh, from an OECD point of view. Thank you. Okay, and we'll keep an eye on that report coming out on the 5th of October. Thank you so much for that, Kurt van Dender there. And I'd like to pass on to um, our panellist, Femke Grutheis there, the founder and president of the EX Tax Project, for your take. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me here. Um, of course, uh, at the moment, uh, governments are in full crisis mode, of course, and uh, swift action is needed for both households and, and businesses with the war in Europe um, and an energy crisis and inflation on everybody's mind. But at the same time, we need to keep working on the mid to long term solutions for the massive social and environmental challenges that we're facing, um, being the climate crisis, obviously, resource supply uh, risks, um, import dependency and unemployment. And I'd like to mention that the energy transition in itself is a labor intensive transition. Um, when you want to retrofit your home, you need skilled people to come in and give you advice, um, update the systems in your house, install new pipelines and, and inst insulation, which is all labor intensive and, and, and um, man, you know, man-made uh, activities. The IMF has projected that um, producing a, a gigawatt hour of energy using solar power actually um, requires seven times more jobs than use, uh, producing the same amount of energy using coal. So our tax system, unfortunately, currently is a barrier for renewable energy um, initiatives um, and for solving the skills gap there because 5.4 trillion euros in taxes are collected each year, of which less than 6% are green taxes on energy mainly and mobility, and just 0.2% of tax revenues are based on pollution and resources. And in addition, we're actually subsidizing fossil fuels um, to the tune of at least 50 billion a year, um, and a, a number that will probably increase um, based on the, the crisis um, and rather than go down. So. The problem is that governments tend to put a high tax burden on, on labour. Um, um, or more than half of tax revenues are based on personal income tax, social contributions and payroll taxes. Um, and so these taxes actually reduce net income, the take-home pay of workers. And they are also an incentive for businesses to minimise labour input, even if that means using more resources or more energy because they tend to be uh, less taxed. Um, so the debate is, goes far beyond uh, the discussion around energy taxes or the ETS, and we're therefore very pleased the Commission has uh, started a review of the tax mix of the future. Um, and for the past 13 years, we have been researching the role of tax in achieving the goals of the circular inclusive economy um, and basically looking at the tax shift from labour taxes to, to green taxes. Um, so we do this with fix, fiscal experts and we developed uh, very fairly recently another broad-based tax shift scenario, um, which appears from the modeling results to be very good for the economy, good for jobs. Um, it saves a lot of billions of euros on our energy import bill. And it's also a fair transition because the lowest income groups benefit the most from, from this change. Um, so taxes steer the economy and they are a key to achieving the goals, not just the energy transition, climate neutral uh, a continent, but also um, the circular economy and the social goals of the European um, Union. So it's crystal clear now that change is needed uh, and our tax systems need to change as well. Thank you so much there, uh, Femke Grutheis, saying that change 
is needed. And I think the European Commission has indeed got the message because even earlier this year, the European Court of Auditors put out a report saying that energy taxation and carbon pricing policies and fossil fuel subsidies must be more aligned more closely if the EU wants to reach all its goals of 2030 and 2050 to be carbon neutral. So thank you so much, Femke, there for putting all the facts on the table for us. Now I'd like to hand over to Christian Valenduk, Professor at University of Leuven de la Neuf here in Belgium for your thoughts on that first question. Thanks and thanks for the invitation. Uh, of course, taxation matters. Uh, when I refer to taxation, it's not only tax rate, but it, it's, it's also tax breaks that, that may matter. So I think that, they, that, that the first way in which taxation may contribute, and it's not, only, it's not only the first way, it's the first step, I think, is dismantling fossil fuels subsidies. Uh, according to the Belgian inventory of fossil fuel subsidies, at the federal level, we have 2.4 of GDP uh, of fossil fuel subsidies, the bulk of that coming from taxation, coming from uh, uh, rates on excise duties that are lower than the benchmark, exemption and uh, other tax breaks. If we take a broader view, including subsidies to transport, we have 2.9 of GDP due to the well-known company car regime in Belgium. So it's the first step uh, is the levelling of the player fields and the dismantling of fossil fuels subsidy. Uh, second step, the second step is to include external cost. Uh, and maybe taxation is a concept that is too narrow. What matters is carbon pricing. Um, Tradable permits have FFX that are quite similar to taxes, and I think that both instruments may be used. The Fit for 55 package is using both instruments, I think, and, and it's and it's and it is the right way to go. Uh, there is a pending issue. In addition to that, do we need subsidies for the development of new technologies? Uh, there is a quite wide consensus in, among economists on having a, on having a Consensus among economists is not frequent. I assume you know that <laughs> there is a quite there is a consensus in, among economists of, about the fact that there is a case from the tax policy point of view for subsidising R and D. The question is, in addition to that, uh, do we have to take into account that in addition to the externalities that arise from innovation, we also have to take into account externalities that arise from the the uh, the effect of new technology. Or, of green technology, in fact. There might be the case, I think, for subsidizing uh, green R&D investment, maybe more than R&D investment as such, uh, and even a case for subsidizing not only innovation, uh, but the implementation of these subsidies. There is, of course, a conflict between long-term issues and short-term issues uh, today. Uh, I fully agree with Kurt. The uh, elasticities on the on the long term are higher than on a short term basis, and this means that implementing uh, these two options now should have very strong uh, effect on the processing powers of all the world. It, it, it will top up to the increase in the price that we face today. Uh, what matters, I feel, is to have policies that do not destroy the price signal. It's the is the, is the key message, I think, that, that I would like to deliver on the issue of the conflict between short-term and long-term issues we face today. Thanks. Okay. Christian Valenduk, there, Professor at the University of Leuven, thank you so much. Uh, Gerasimus Thomas, any reactions there to what you've heard so far? I think that uh, the main ideas uh, that expressed around the table from the very different perspectives converge. I think, uh, first, that uh, taxation is part of the toolkit, so we need regulation, we need carbon pricing, and we need taxation. Then we can discuss a little bit the weight that we give to this. In the Fit for 55 package that the Commission has proposed, we have around 50% uh, is uh, around the carbon pricing, uh, uh, 30 to 40% is regulation, and 10% is taxation, just to indicatively paint the picture. And in other countries, this weighting is different. Eh? Mm. In, there are, in the U.S., at the other end of the spectrum, they have uh, mainly regulation and some taxation incentives or so. They have very little or non-carbon pricing, or they have in some uh, states. So I think we all agree that uh, I think in this, in this table that we need 
the different tools and I think we are more like-minded than, uh, you know, as Europeans vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US that we need a significant part on carbon pricing and for us it's called ETS. It is also covers the CBAM, which is the mirror carbon border adjustment mechanism is built around ETS and it is mirroring, you know, the, the main concept that we have. Nevertheless, I think it is important what uh, uh, Kurt said uh, it is essential and the role of the, to, of the OECD in that sense is important to monitor what is go, going on globally. Not between only the G7, not only between the G20, but we need to be more inclusive and the OECD is the best place to do this and uh, offer the basis on which uh, uh, more global discussions take place. I think they have the methodology, they have the tools, the access to information. And the last thing that I see uh, very uh, positive from FEMCE is that uh, we have uh, an engaging and, and positively engaging private sector. Because uh, uh, this transformation, whether we talk about energy specifically or before climate, we have an important role uh, of the climate sector. We like to say here in our Brussels uh, jargon that uh, the Green Deal is our growth policy or growth uh, strategy or so. It is true that uh, uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, hope for our this transition lies with the private sector and we like very much that the, from all sides the private sector is engaged and it's supporting these decisions even if there are discussions on the details the overall uh, strategy, including post-crisis and post-war, people see the need to stick to the 2030 strategy, uh, uh, despite the difficult conditions in the short term. And I would say in some uh, quarters there is also a need for more uh, <coughs> ambition. Now, the last thing I would say, because we talk in abstract about uh, the public and the private, I mean, we do have very active member states, the governments, I mean, uh, we have 14 member states, for example, that they have included uh, uh, measures supporting what we are discussing here uh, in tax measures, green tax measures. They have included them in uh, RRPs in this uh, next generation EU. We have all the member states collectively who spend more than uh, close to 40% of their next generation EU, and this will probably go up with the revision on the Green Deal and the large part on Repower EU. So this also reflects that at the level of the electorate, the level of the national government, people think that the green transition is a win-win. They are struggling sometimes, you know, how to do in the short term, but I think uh, the, the, the goal is very much anchored in our society. Okay, Jerasimus, thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to ask you all a very brief question, given that EU energy ministers from across the continent will be meeting here tomorrow to discuss the rising energy prices. So is there any role for energy taxation to mitigate the impact of those rising energy prices? Perhaps, Femke, I'll start with you. At the moment, they are, of course, reduced in a number of countries, and um, um, they are one of the tools that can be used to, to support households and businesses. Um, so, um, I do think we have to be careful there because the incentives um, um, are there for a reason. Now that the prices are sky high, I can imagine there are short-term measures to be taken, but we have to continue to, to look at um, both energy taxes and other environmental taxes to, to support the transition uh, that is still needed and is even more topical today than it was maybe a year ago. Kurt? Yes, thanks. I mean, clearly several countries do think that uh, energy taxes, taxes on energy use have a role to play in, in dealing with the prices because many of them are reducing them, as has been mm -hmm. said. We actually took stock of, of what countries were doing. Uh, we started before summer and, and had a first look at what that meant in terms of uh, equivalent carbon prices. Um, the tax cuts at that point, and many of those are being continued at this point, uh, are equivalent to an uh, implicit carbon price reduction of more than 50 euros in, in, in a lot of uh, countries uh, within Europe. So these are very significant cuts. Um, there is, of course, the standard um, economist's reaction, uh, which is to say, you know, it's better to um, um, deal with these kinds of price spikes by 
providing targeted income transfers to households and businesses because uh, that works better. Um, it's less distortive, it's more targeted, it will cost you less in terms of foregone revenue and, and all these kinds of things. Um, this is true. Countries are aware of this. We saw when we looked at how countries re responded over time that they started to shift over time towards income-based measures. But I said that this was before summer. And then uh, the invasion was there and countries went back to, uh, uh, to price based measures and, and continue um, to do that. Um, so, I mean, what's the overriding objective in also a long run perspective? I mean, the sh in the short run, it's energy affordability, right? In the long run, it's also energy affordability, because if you don't commit to energy affordability, then there's not going to be a uh, transition to net zero, right? I mean, this is a prerequisite. Therefore, I think this kind of rush to try to reduce prices and somehow maintain energy affordability in the highly exceptional situation that you're in uh, at this point, um, we can be a little bit less harsh with our usual economic uh, recipes than, than we would normally be. That's, that would be my take on that. That said, the longer it takes, the more we should start thinking about targeting and moving towards uh, income-based approaches. But one can understand at this point, um, short-run objective and the long-run mm -hmm. objective from a security point of view, from a climate point of view, is energy affordability. Energy affordability. Okay, Kurt van Denner, thank you so much. One other question, brief question for our panellists, perhaps for Christian Vallenduk, this question regarding the effects of high energy prices on water security. What do you think can be done to address that? Well, it refers to, to the last point I made in my previous intervention. In fact, uh, it's clear that there's an issue of energy aff affordability we face today. Uh, the best way to deal it is to have to in income transfer. I agree on that. Uh, but when I look at what governments are doing, including the Belgian government, it's just cutting taxes across the board. This means distorting, this means distorting the price signal. So uh, the view of economics, it, it's, it, it's not the right way to go. Uh, but it's quite a, a tricky issue to, to reconcile the issue of energy of affordability, energy poverty on the short term basis and the, and the fact that we need to keep some quite significant price signal over the medium and long term. And, uh, uh, targeting is the first best, mm -hmm. uh, but the issue is how should we target uh, from a political point of view, <laughs> it's more easy to cut excise duties or to cut VAT from the normal rate to the to the reduced trade than to discuss on how to target. And there are various definitions of what the middle class is, the more political parties, and then you end up with a quite complicated story. And uh, when I look at what governments have been doing, not only in my country, finally, they end up with compensation that are given uh, to a very significant part uh, of the population, mm -hmm. far above the median income, I think. Thank you. Jasmus, Thomas? Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I want to, to emphasize that targeting is the necessary option. We cannot afford to pay our way out of the crisis. It's bad for environment, it's bad for public finances. So targeting is necessary. I think we have some measurement issues. So the definition of uh, vulnerable households is broader in this crisis than it is the traditionally done for traditional social policies, and we have to take into account. I had a meeting with the trade unions yesterday, and then around 53% of the population, it's a significant part of the population that needs to make ends meet, and it's constrained by energy prices, but some targeting is necessary, and you know, uh, uh, some governments have taken measures that it is uh, um, a, a free, as, uh, let's say, um, uh, support to all, including those that do not need it. And I think that is uh, necessary to, to keep in mind. In our uh, regulation that it is discussed in the Energy Council tomorrow morning, we have very specific articles on the use of the revenues. We propose to raise some extraordinary one-off measures uh, with uh, a revenue cap and a solidarity contributions, but we are very specific 
on where this extra revenue has to be used and it has to be used to those who need it. We cannot afford, following the financial crisis, the COVID crisis, the increased expenditure for defence, we need to prioritise where we spend the money and people like me, they do not need an energy subsidy. And other people, much less than me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dear Osimo Stamis, thank you so much for that honesty. Um, Court Van Denner, I think you wanted to make a very brief comment. And just in the room, if there's anyone who wants to ask a question on what you've heard so far, or anyone out there, feel free by using Slido or in the room. Yeah. No, I actually wanted to, 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 to make the point that has been raised. Yes, we should target. Uh, we should. Uh, be aware, though, that it will take time to get there, right? It's, it's not so easy. It's not just income. It's where people live. It's in what kinds of houses they live. It's all these kinds of things. So it is a type of targeting uh, which is needed, which is actually quite challenging to put together. Uh, and there, I think, uh, some, some innovation in the mechanisms of, of how to do this is needed. I mean, there, the pushback you sometimes get if you say, we should target. Say, sure, but how? And it's actually not so easy to answer. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, what we need to improve. Okay. Not so easy to answer. If there are no questions from the room, I will then move on to the next uh, theme, which is all about the climate goals of the European Union and how taxation can contribute there when it comes to bringing about the switch to cleaner energy and also a more sustainable industry and water security as part of a socially fair and green transition. Who on the panel would like to tackle that question first? Femke, you look very enthusiastic, <laughs> so go for it. Yes. Um, yeah, so what you raise is a question around the interconnectedness of, of various challenges, again, that we're facing um, and, and how to align tax systems with, you know, solving those, those crises. I mean, the, the energy crisis is fully related to the circular economy challenge because half of greenhouse gas emissions globally are actually related to materials management. And so um, shifting energy sources is not enough. It's about shifting consumption patterns um, as well as production, of course. And so um, uh, the, the challenges, again, of sustainable industry, water security, as you mentioned, and inclusive circular economy are interconnected. And the polluter pays principle are actually, is actually a, a, a founding a principle in the founding treaties of the European Union, um, as well as, you know, the goals of, of, of a well-functioning labour market and welfare system and eliminating poverty. And there was poverty before these crises, uh, this crisis emerged. Um, so these are core EU objectives and um, taxes underpin each of those, uh, of those goals. And so this is why in our latest study we, we include um, a series of, of measures in, in a scenario where we, we actually apply the polluter-based principle by um, putting a price on air pollution, by industries, uh, shipping and aviation, putting a higher price on water, bulk use uh, in, in principle, carbon emissions, fuels used for plastics produce, production, but also VAT rates can be used as well as a kilometer charge and tobacco charges uh, based on their environmental impact, not just their health impact. And so in our scenario, the, the revenues are actually used to reduce the tax burden uh, for income uh, for households and especially uh, support for low-income groups, as well as support to employers who, um, who invest in jobs and skills, um, as well as circular innovation. And so this is about a systemic shift in incentives, and the Green Deal actually recognises uh, the need for such, a, for such a rebalancing of the tax mix. And again, a growing group of business leaders, um, as well as experts and organisations, are uh, supportive of the idea that we should turn tax into a force for good, um, of obviously beyond, beyond this, this current crisis, and to create a level playing field for sustainable and inclusive business models. Um, and if we are to provide subsidies, let's not forget to subsidize or to support and to focus on people and their skills, right? So um, uh, skilling and reskilling, apprenticeship, um, we need so many technicians also for the energy transition. So to support that employment and the transition on the, on the labor market will be tremendously important. I mean, there's still 14 mil million people unemployed in the EU, um, but the underutilized labor potential is 29 million. So there's still untapped potential, but a mismatch between demand and, um, 
and supply of, of, of labor. So, um, you know, the, the Commission has stated earlier that smart taxation is a winning strategy in a great video on, on the tax shift. And I think the, the current crisis, again, under, underlines how important that, uh, that will be. Thank you so much, Femke, there for those ideas. Uh, Geraldine Thomas, would you like to react to those and um, give us your take as well on how taxation can help bring about the EU's climate policy goals? Uh, I think I, I agree and, uh, uh, with Femke on the, this, on the, on the tax shift uh, idea. We have to uh, overall increase the tax revenue and we also need to shift, uh, let's say, the tax burden and uh, uh, within that. So I think this is very useful. Uh, I think it is, uh, we have to deal with the two challenges. The first is uh, where do we shift from into? Do we have good ideas? How quickly we can do it uh, without harming uh, uh, tax revenue that we need in the coming years, particularly during the crisis and beyond? And uh, the third, I think um, when we choose new, um, uh, let's say, uh, tax areas, particularly if they are uh, areas uh, that to incentivize the energy transition, I think we an inherent problem of uh, uh, having a less, st each of these new areas that we tax uh, is less uh, sustainable, less stable. So we tax more, uh, you know, fossil fuels, eventually fossil fuels, uh, consumption will go away and the tax revenue will be reduced and so on. So we need to treat, and I think that's a good uh, work that uh, they have done in X tax. We need to treat all these behavioral taxes together as a package, and each one of them uh, will have a different behavior over time. And I think it is useful. Now, I think uh, uh, from our side, uh, we have concentrated um, uh, now with the current legislation on the table. We have concentrated on, uh, um, let's say, energy intensive industry transition. We have a, a reform of the ETS that uh, uh, looks at uh, how our industry adjusts, and we have the carbon border adjustment mechanism that helps third country companies adjust. It is addressed to companies and tries to give incentives to companies in certain sectors in the short term and eventually all energy in, in, uh, intensive sectors or most of them to adjust their behavior by uh, uh, making them focus on carbon pricing. I think we have in our legislation also uh, tax in this, uh, let's say, um, proposals to uh, deal with aviation and shipping. So these are new tax areas that uh, uh, we give them incentives to think more about sustainability in these industries. Traditionally, in some of them, the engagement in sustainability has been low, uh, given that, uh, you know, they had an international environment. So we need to have this uh, first mover advantage and then give the right incentives to them in the aviation industry, in maritime industry. And then we have uh, uh, issues on uh, resources. I think our environmental policy has room for more taxation uh, initiatives. People are, let's say, more familiar with the plastics tax, which is not something that every individual pays, but everybody has noticed the effect of it, that you know, you yeah. uh, have in the society a, a gradual and in some cases very fast elimination of plastics. And I think these uh, so-called so behavioral taxes are, are uh, uh, very much uh, to be used in the future. Uh, I think we have uh, a substantial help with the, from the economic community and the academic and research community on this. We have uh, a lot of local initiatives, and uh, I think we are now to build a stronger case for, let's say, federal, EU level, and international initiatives. And uh, I think this is very much necessary. Uh, labor taxation ha is quite high. And we have been trying to get it down uh, for the last 10 years. It goes down slowly, uh, uh, but it does go down. It has gone down by about 6% over the last 10 years. But I think we need fast to see alternatives that will both help the green transition. And uh, 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 I would say, however, to agree with the Christ, both Christian and Kurt in the very first beginning, these are policies that bring need time 
to react. So they, they cannot, you cannot adjust behavior in two years or three years. You need to give it a decade. So we need all to be very patient. Um, just you mentioned shipping, and we have a question uh, from the audience regarding shipping. How about the taxonomy and maritime? Is the tailpipe approach really fit for purpose when it comes to reducing CO2 emissions in shipping? Thank you so much for that question. Um, would you like to answer it or Femke? So the, the issue with maritime shipping is that it's tremendously polluting and it's still fueling our, our economies and our, and our consumption patterns. So unless we find a new way of transportation that is based on zero carbon and other types of pollution, I mean, we can't have global trade basically in a one and a half degree world or a carbon neutral world if, if there is no solution for shipping. So I think the incentives for shipping have been lacking and we have to uh, applaud the, the initiatives taken to, 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 um, to start uh, the, 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 the pricing in of externalities in, 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 in shipping. Um, and, and it's also included in our, in our scenario. And we hear from the sector um, that there, there are companies like Marsk that call for a high price on carbon emissions for their sector, uh, for them in order to uh, have a business case for different types of fuels and solutions that, that are more sustainable. Um, so I think what, what, it, what, what we've reached a sort of a turning point where in every sector and in every business there is now the question of how are we going to adapt to these changing circumstances, how are we going to stay competitive in this, uh, in this climate neutral world. Um, and many businesses actually have started new business models and started implementing new activities, but it's very difficult to scale them up if there's no business case because of the financial incentives embedded in our tax system. So yeah, it's very important that we look at um, a broader spectrum of uh, pricing of externalities, not just carbon, but also the other pollution coming from, from shipping and other industries. And I think the, sector is, the sectors are getting ready and prepared for that kind of measures. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Christian, I'd like to hear your thoughts now on um, taxation, its role in bringing about the EU's climate goal policies or policy goals. On the point of tax shift, um, I think my view, relying on the decades during which I've been a civil servant involved in tax policy, uh, is that a key issue when we are designing a change in, in the tax structure, the to green the tax system, I think, is we have to choose the way to go. Uh, the first option is to cut some tax on labor. There is a wide consensus that taxation of labor is too high. And then we finance it with green taxes. Option two is we have climate, we have a climate strategy. Climate strategy needs to put externalities into price. Taxation is one of the ways to do that. So let's design the tax system we need from a climate point of view. And then let's have a second discussion on how we use the revenue from that. This means in option one is let's cut tax and use and let's use the green tax to finance a cut on a cut on a labor tax. Option two is let's design the tax system we need from an environmental point of view and then let's decide about how we allocate the revenue from that. My experience that green tax reform that have succeeded are those who have chosen option two. The case of the world of the yellow vest in France is a clear case of what way you may occur when you would just rely on option one. So uh, I think the tax shift we need, from my view, is option two. Let's, let's design the tax we need to have a green deal that is successful uh, to meet our climate objective, and then let's use the revenue to compensate uh, uh, losers that are to compensate firms and so on, to compensate maybe also to train workers because there are strong reallocation among workers that will accuse. Let's use the revenue from that. From my view, it's the right way to make some tax. The right way, but not an easy way, right? I mean, if it was, it would have been done 
already. Um, of course, do you want to say something? Otherwise, Femke, you wanted to comment? I'd just like to add that the uh, yellow vest did, did not uh, uh, spark the unrest because of a tax shift. It was because of a price increase that was not compensated and that was not a shift. Uh, also, wealth tax was uh, abolished or lowered uh, just before that. So that actually was the spark in the in the in the oil barrel, as I as as, as we say, um, that sparked the unrest. So it's perfectly possible to design social policies that also serve environmental interests. And you know, I can speak a bit more about that later. Yes, yeah, perfectly possible. Okay, uh, Kurt, we would like to hear as well from you your thoughts on how to use tax in the context of climate, right? That's, I, that's I think, where, where the question started. Um, it's actually interesting that you ask that question in that way, because I, th I think if you look at that question and compare it to your first question, uh, 20 years ago, people would have said, but that's the same. Yeah. Um, climate is one source of external costs, among others, and we should treat it in the same way. I think um, the debate has moved, the approach to climate has moved to, um, and it's slightly different from, from your emphasis, I think, to a place where it's not mostly in the climate context, it's not mostly about internalizing external costs, but it is about transforming the economy. Um, so we need an economic transformation. So the internalization approach to, do, to energy taxation, which is useful in most cases, is about let's try to measure these external costs, let's try to move the taxes in that direction, and then something will happen. We use the revenues in some way, and something will happen. There will be an economic outcome, there will be adaptations, and in a sense, whatever these are, um, these will be good because the economy is now more efficient, right? So that's kind of uh, the point of view there, a very big focus on trying to align the instrument with the external costs. Now we're in climate. In climate, we, meet, we have committed to moving to net zero for very good reasons. And that's what uh, needs to uh, drive our policy design. Uh, and this means, it's been said before, yes, tax is part of the toolkit, but only part of the toolkit. And we need to think about policy packages that, um, that are going to get us on that path to net zero. And it's been observed already, we're not uh, there quite yet. How are we not there? Well. Going back to some of our data on the state of carbon pricing, state of effective carbon rates. Effective carbon rates, OECD definition is we look at carbon taxes, we look at emissions tradings, price signals, and we look at fuel excise taxes and combine those. I'm going to give a couple of numbers for the G20 change between 2018 and uh, 2021. Good news, the coverage of emissions by pricing systems tax, trading systems, fuel excise has gone up a lot. Almost half of emissions are now uh, covered by some form of, of taxation or emissions pricing. Almost half. So the other half not, right, in 2021. Um, that's not a statement about the EU. That's a statement about G20, to be clear. Um, also good news, the average price has increased between 2018 and 21. So coverage is up, a broader base. Also, the average rate is up. The average rate is now four euros per ton of CO2. So that's the bad news. It is up, but it is still very low. Um, and four euros on average is not what will get, get you meaningful change, right? Um, now, immediately, one has to qualify this average number. The differences across countries and across sectors are so large that this four is kind of an av average of zeros in some places and relatively high rates in other places, uh, including in, in um, the European Union. So we need to move forward. The EU wants to move forward with relying on prices. It wants to phase out free permits for very good reasons. Well, this becomes difficult. You need to think about um, accompanying measures other than free permits. And that again takes us to the border carbon uh, adjustment approach. So there is progress with carbon pricing, but there is a long way to go and different countries do different things. Where are implicit carbon prices high? I've said it before, they are high in the transport sector. More than 300 euros per ton in some countries implicitly, right? So that's, that's a, a high number. Um, question for discussion. I sometimes wonder, uh, with that kind of relatively high rate in that sector and lower rates elsewhere, 
Uh, does it really make sense to try to emphasize going for still higher prices in transport, or should we start thinking about other measures in transport, infrastructure for electric vehicles, and uh, these kinds of things? Um, last point on this, we talk about carbon pricing a lot. We should talk about carbon pricing a lot. But if we think about tax policy for climate change, we should look broader. So we should screen the full tax code. We should look at personal income taxes, corporate income taxes, to see if at the least they don't hold back uh, going to net zero and ideally uh, be neutral. Or it's a point of discussion, should they be geared towards uh, climate goals? A couple of examples, company cars, it has been mentioned. Ideally, oh, you want to get rid of huge them. Huge um, <laughs> But, or at least you want to get rid of the preferential tax treatment. Let me be careful there. Um, if that's not possible, you should think about um, maybe situations where you can at least use the company car fleet to green the full car fleet. This is something which Belgium um, has been considering and moving in that direction, for example. Not ideal, but still something worth considering. Um, fee baits, bonus malus in French, um, lower rates for uh, less polluting vehicles, more efficient vehicles, uh, higher purchase uh, rates for the more polluting vehicles. Um, in this transformational versus marginal change perspective, does it make sense to provide relative tax, advantage, tax advantages to uh, technologies that are hybrid, that don't fully shift to EVs yet? Or should we instead gear this towards the technology shift entirely and think about EVs only? It's a question. I uh, bring up the question. A big question also is corporate income tax. Is it technology neutral? Um, that's a very difficult question, which we are beginning to think about. And that's an emerging debate, I think. Um, how does the rest of the tax code look in terms of alignment with climate goals? And I expect that we will be talking about this a lot in addition to carbon pricing from a climate point of view in the next couple of years. Great. A long list of ideas there from uh, Kurt. Thank you so much uh, for those. Would you like to react to anything you heard there, Josimus? No? And anyone in the room like to comment on anything you've heard so far? Any questions? Everyone getting a bit tired? Okay, well, it's just five o'clock and we do have a little bit more time to dive into the last theme. We've touched on it a little bit earlier, which is the movement of the Gilets Jaunes and energy poverty, but I'd like to just take a few minutes to delve a little bit more into that topic of how EU tax policy can help to mitigate the disproportionate impact of energy prices on the most vulnerable households across Europe, those at risk of living in energy or transport poverty. Femke, start with you. So our research shows that it's perfectly possible to design um, policies that address social issues and, and environmental issues at the same time. It's all about smart use of, of the resources, uh, the revenue, sorry, and choosing policies that, that work. At the same time, you know, we can really get stuck in the details of specific measures. And sometimes it feels a bit like we're, you know, rearranging the deck chairs on a Titanic, um, and, and which is not sufficient, obviously, to, to avert the, the dangers. And, and this is why, you know, the, the social challenge is, is huge and we have to take it into account on a 50-50 basis and not just as a sort of a patch on, 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 a, on, on a policy that, uh, that might have a negative impact. So we're very um, pleased with the OECD inclusive framework on carbon uh, mitigation options and we really hope that that will include a debate around the use of revenues as well. Um, um, because social and green are really two sides of the same coin. And an important note is that um, um, climate impact is not just in the first place, right? Um, so low-income groups are, uh, tend to be more exposed to the health hazard and impacts of climate change and disruption. And, um, and effective action there is, is of the utmost importance, especially for the low-income groups and, and, of course, unemployed uh, people. And so um, the EU could really play a role here by, first of all, we think um, working on a policy tracker, an EU policy tracker, that at least 
um, gives member states the opportunity to track what's happening in other member states, uh, not just in terms of legislation, but the process before that, what is being contemplated, what is being tested and tried and debated. And so we can learn from each other and, and, and coordinate that action as well. Also, the Commission could set minimum rates for a, a variety of, of resource uses and types of pollution, for example, on water usage um, for bulk users, but also pollution from industries and, and, and plastics at the beginning of the pipeline rather than at the end of the pipeline. Um, and so to provide also guidance on the use of revenues, uh, I think that the European um, institutions could really play a role there to, um, to support member states in, in how to address social issues and environmental issues at the same time. Okay, Femke, well, you have a lot of um, ideas and a long to-do list there for Gerasmus Thomas and your colleagues there at the European Commission. So I'd like to hear, do you feel sometimes in your job that you're rearranging the deck or the seats on the, on the Titanic? Uh, no, not exactly. But I think we uh, agree a lot on the fact that all this green transition has to be based on the issues of fairness. And uh, this goes for the whole package, not only for the uh, taxation tools and measures. So fairness is a necessary component for this transition. Um, I think we also need to keep in mind the issue of, uh, it was mentioned, I think, by Christian earlier on, uh, this uh, green transition brings a societal change and uh, reskilling change. It's not only to do the energy efficiency measures and uh, for our buildings, but we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, by the time we reach uh, uh, zero carbon in 2050, we will have uh, more than 50% of the technologies that we will be using mid-century do not exist today. So we will be in a completely different uh, environment with regards to technologies, to innovations. A lot of the current technologies will disappear and new that we don't even know today will have to spring up. So there is a significant, uh, uh, let's say, element of uh, 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 you know, uh, dealing with the uh, groups of the population uh, that uh, need to be reskilled, need to be adapted, and therefore fairness is a necessary component. We need to accompany the population uh, in, uh, in this transition, which is very necessary for the good of the planet, for uh, the good of our economy, so that we remain leaders in this transform transformation. But I think the demands are, are very important. Now, uh, our uh, policies from the Commission, they always have uh, these complementary tools. You know, when we have the Fit for 55, um, uh, we have accompanied it with a significant investment uh, in green transition through the next generation EU. We have accompanied it with the Just Transition Fund. We have accompanied the structural funds with a significant component of green transition. The same for the European Social Fund. We have included uh, a, a, part, a, a big package on, on reskilling and retraining. And last but not least, in the ETS2 reform, we have a social climate fund. So uh, there are always these components that, uh, as I say, that uh, also for, for the crisis, they are needed. Uh, we need to have targeted support, but the support we need to give is substantial, and our tools uh, have to be uh, designed to deal with these uh, issues. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, uh, the structure of uh, our tax systems and the tax mix that we choose gives the right incentives to the private investment or to the change of the behavior. It's a complicated exercise. Uh, I think in Europe we are more willing than uh, other continents to uh, use more tools. Uh, the main discussion we have with our partners is that uh, both some of our uh, G7 partners, like the US, but also for some of the uh, um, um, less developed partners, they find it easier to deal with regulation, uh, but uh, uh, regulation also has a long lead times and has a lot of administrative burden and control measures. So we think uh, that in this uh, package of tools that we have, uh, uh, you know, we do have these market-based measures that we complement them with, uh, with social support. Um, 
it's a necessary exercise. I think it, uh, it works. The next generation EU, even if it's not wholly focused on these issues, it shows that it can lead both to reform and to results on the ground. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's, it's useful to get, uh, let's say, the dynamic uh, evaluation, you know, in partnership with the, um, the academia, institutions or the OECD to try to adapt it because as we move forward, there are adaptations we need to make uh, as the world move, uh, moves forward. And just on a couple of the ideas that Femke put out there, would you have any direct reaction to that idea of a policy tracker you mentioned or a minimum rate on pollution? Would any of those ideas work, you think? I think uh, the, the policy tracker, uh, we do the, the policies, if I understand well, you know, you want to not only look at the indicators or the legislation, but you want to see the driver of the legislations. I have... Uh, Probably we, we might not have it in the nice form that you have here in your uh, own <laughs> graphs, but I think uh, it is actually the Commission is the one which spends more time than any other organization within Europe, let's say, to look at how the governments come to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, to, to reform proposals and uh, then uh, to interact with them. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we are... Um, uh, ready to to sort of to be transparent about this. I think it is very important to to keep track of the rest of the world, and thus I think the OECD is well placed to do that and give us the inside knowledge on this. So uh, yes, the uh, tracking the policies around is good, but uh, with the purpose. So we do it for uh, getting best practices. We do it to. Uh, through our recommendations to adjust the ones, because not all of everybody, people need a bit of scolding sometimes to uh, governments to get in the good uh, things, and then uh, in order to get the good allocation of resources. Our experience uh, in the EU, uh, in the different, uh, in the in the funding allocations, uh, has been mixed. In some cases, uh, you know, our. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, allocation of EU funding has been in some cases more successful, in other cases less successful. So we need this constant uh, evaluation of the measures to make sure also that the funding that it is uh, created at European level or, or co-managed with the member states at European level is well targeted. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Chris, I'll come to you in a sec, but Christian, you, your turn. Yeah, I would like to come back on the issue of fairness, I fully agree with you. Fairness matters; uh, otherwise, otherwise we will not succeed. But the issue is, what do we mean by fairness, and how do we make the climate transition fair? Uh, fairness is not only an issue of distributional effect of of today; it's a first an issue of distribution between generations. So uh, at the and the, the first reason why we need to be fair, we need to be fair between to be fair between generations. Now it's clear that inaction will be unfair. Inaction will be unfair vis-à-vis -vis future generation, and today inaction will be unfair because it will be it the poor more than the rich. It's true within country and it's true between country. Now, how to be fair? Uh, the way the issue is discussed is often the following one. Uh, uh, carbon tax, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> carbon tax are unfair because they eat the poor more than the rich. So let's forego uh, carbon tax and let's use other uh, other policy instruments like no regulation and subsidies and so on. I think it's not the right way to go. The issue is not uh, is carbon pricing fair or unfair. Is what about the fairness of carbon pricing in comparison with the impact on fairness of other policies? Uh, are norms and regulations more fair than a package of carbon pricing and revenue recycling? Are subsidies more fair than such a package? Sub the empirical evidence up to now is that subsidies benefit the rich more than the poor, so they, have, they also have an uh, adverse effect. And from an international point of view, there is a cost today that the government have to face. Uh, 
but the benefits may occur later in the future, but there is a cost. So uh, designing fairness is something maybe more complicated than we may fall. <laughs> than, than we may just a quick reaction. As an economist, I fully agree with Christian. <laughs> I think that, uh, however, um, you know, from where we sit, uh, unfortunately, we have to keep an eye on the rest of the world. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, on regulation, I think we can manage the relationship between regulation and uh, pricing, and we are in favor of pricing and not of regulation. But when it comes to subsidies, I mean, uh, you know, we need to keep an eye on our major partners. Uh, in the US, uh, just now, last August, with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there is substantial subsidies going on to some of the industries with which we try to green as well. Uh, some of the subsidies, to be fair, they are also benefiting European businesses based in the US, but uh, I think this is an issue to keep the overall picture. In China, uh, they have a different uh, green policy. They do have a green policy. Uh, but uh, the amount of subsidies and the instruments that they use are uh, important to keep in mind when we look also at our international competitiveness. So we cannot look at this triangle of regulation, carbon pricing and subsidies only looking inward. We have to pay attention to our competitors for our industry and for our consumers. Um. Kurt van Dender, final word on that topic to yourself. Yes, very interesting, actually. Very yeah. interesting statements. Inaction is unfair, um, agree. Um, but um, what type of action should we decide that then is necessary? I mean, it's a long way to go from saying, you know, we need to pay attention uh, to what happens to future generation, which to an extent is what climate policy used to be about, because it's now also about now. Uh, but it doesn't follow that, therefore, the case for carbon pricing is made. We're very far from that situation. Um, and, and also, carbon pricing, um, less, un less unfair than other policies, potentially, in some cases. Um, okay, here's a policy uh, which we tell people is um, maybe a little bit unfair, but anything else that we might do would be still more unfair. This is not good political communication. This will not get you very far. So. We need, we need to, um, on the policy package that we are going to select, we need to make sure that this is perceived as being sufficiently fair. And that's the question uh, that we, we, we need to answer. Um, can tax help there? Yes, tax can help shape distributional outcomes. Uh, we know this. The point has been made, a very important has been made, point has been made. It's not just about correcting outcomes, it's about making sure that the pre-market outcomes are better skills, um, uh, trainings, all these kinds of things. And that's where social inclusion and coherence can come from, uh, not just from tax corrections once um, um, all these things have happened. So um, that's a little bit trying to say that the social cohesion and fairness question is one which is much more general than climate policy and revenue use alone. Uh, and that, I mean, there's sometimes this tendency, I think, to expect too much from climate policy and particularly revenue use, like this is now going to be the tool that's going to make climate policy uh, inclusive and therefore acceptable. That's asking a lot from revenue use alone. I mean, you can do things with revenue use. You can seek to maintain affordability. You can cut other taxes. I tend to agree with Christian that focusing on, on political feasibility when deciding about revenue use could be uh, could dominate the argument. But even then, um, I mean, there is evidence, for example, from Canadian studies, ex post studies, where there is evidence that the revenue use decision, which in that case was to give a lump sum transfer to households, has not materially changed people's views of carbon pricing, in contrast to what we often uh, think would be the case. So we have to be careful in what we expect from um, revenue use in terms of getting us along the um, um, low carbon transition. We have to work on it, no doubt about it, but we have to be aware that it is only one uh, component of a much bigger policy question, I think. Absolutely. Kurt van Dender. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, we've one question there. We have a microphone that can be brought to you in just a sec. If you just also just introduced yourself, that would be fantastic. No. 
Karina is going to bring you a microphone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, because the discussion until now uh, goes a lot about the role of taxation on the production side. Uh, but I'm wondering, like, if you want to uh, save uh, yeah, carbon, uh, then we can also consume less. So I was wondering, do you believe in the role of taxation in order to let us as people consume less and save carbon in that way? Or do you, okay. or do you want to focus on the the repowering of Europe in a green way and not focusing on consumption. And just tell us your name? Jelle. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jelle, for that question. Who would like to take it? Yeah, Jasimus Thomas? No, I think we have touched on this uh, uh, in, in probably we're not so explicit, but the Energy Taxation Directive is about uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, behavior. So fossil fuel will be more expensive than electricity. So when you want to heat your home, or when you want to use a car, or you want to have trucks, it will be uh, more expensive because of the higher taxes to run a diesel uh, car than an electric car uh, over the, once the transition period is over, over transition, the same goes for heating, uh, and the same uh, goes for other, for the use of energy by the, um, uh, let's say, by the uh, uh, small companies or big companies. So if we are looking very much on, on the consumption side, uh, stimulating energy efficiency through a different structure of, uh, let's say, uh, taxation, and also uh, privileging certain types of energy, green energy, as opposed to uh, fossil fuel energy, is an important component of the policy that we already have on the table. Thank you so much for that. Same goes for uh, waste, waste uh, or landfill waste taxes are going up. Water, uh, which is becoming a, sh uh, a, a, a let's say, um, a scarce resource, is being valued and uh, revalued through taxation and so on. Thank you so much for your question. Any more? If not, uh, I would like to give our four panellists just a minute each, just to give us a bit of a wrap-up of the session, a little takeaway that you will bring home this evening from the whole week, in fact, and of this discussion focused on taxation. Christian, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> you look shocked. <laughs> Briefly, the... some point that came in my mind, there was an interesting, an interesting piece of research that has been produced uh, recently. It's a survey that has been conducted in a huge number of countries, asking to citizens if they are aware of climate issue, if they agree with the, the main objective of climate transition. Uh, most of them, they support uh, the fact that, that there isn't climate issues. That, but when questions touch the issue of implementation of the policy package, the consensus disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that's where we stand. I think that the main difficulty is that we face and the government will face, will, will face, I think, that even if people are aware of the climate issue, and maybe they are more aware today than uh, four months ago in some countries of Europe, uh, even if people agree that there is an issue, there is a consensus on that. Consensus disappear when we touch the implementation. Not among young people. Uh, it's not so straightforward when you look at the results, in fact. And I was surprised, in fact, but having in mind the fact that young people are, are more active in, in protests and so on, but it's not so clear. Because I think there is, we need a lot of pedagogy uh, in addition to what we know on the effect of various policy instruments to, uh, to assume, um, to, to succeed in the climate okay. transition. The reform has to be designed at first and they have to be implemented is the second stage okay. of the reform. My and thoughts there from our professor. Thank you so much. Femke, same to you, just a brief, brief thought. Yeah, so um, 
At the moment, the tax system is still aligned with the linear economy. We want to change to a circular economy by 2050, which is a complete overhaul of our production and consumption. And if we want the businesses to actually supply us with the products and services needed to reduce our, our consumption impact, um, then we have to make sure that financial incentives are aligned with those goals. Because currently, um, we speak to a lot of business leaders, and they say that um, Currently, there is a barrier in our tax system because sustainable and inclusive, inclusive entrepreneurs have to go the extra mile. They have to hire people to provide services, um, to reorganize their supply chains, to develop new technologies. Um, so they need to compete with production that that's allowed to, to pollute for free, and they do not go the extra mile. So there is no level playing field, and currently overconsumption is profitable. Uh, which attracts the most capital and what attracts capital grows. So if we want to change the direction of our economy, we have to change our taxes as well. We have to redesign them for a new era. Um, and so, of course, the internal market is best served with um, coordination and therefore, you know, we welcome the Commission's initiatives as well as the Green Deal. Um, and we hope because it includes a promise to focus on the tech shift. Um, as, as I said, our study includes a roadmap as to how national governments and the EU can implement a step-by-step -step approach on this, on this transformation. Um, and, you know, as a citizen, we can use less plastics, we can take the train or eat less meat, but unless we address the fundamental and gigantic financial incentives in our system, um, it's, it's going to be in vain. And we have to make sure that sustainable business becomes the most profitable and most scalable business and becomes mainstream. And to do so, we have to really reassess the tax mix and decide, you know, how to align those tax policies with the goals of zero waste, the circular economy and carbon neutrality. And I mean, we have time, but we have to move now and we have to plan. Um, ahead. Okay, a very passionate pitch there from Femke. Thank you so much for that. And finally there from there, or almost finally there from the OECD, your final wrap thoughts? Yes, thanks. Uh, just three points. I mean, agreement, I think, that tax is a tool when you want to reach environment, climate, uh, energy security goals. Um, I think we also agree that energy affordability in all of that is a central concern now, also in the future. This is key to be able to move forward. Um, Second point, um, the diagnosis is clear. There is a lot to do to improve the contribution that taxes, um, more broadly, carbon pricing in the, in the climate context can, can make uh, to, to getting us forward. It, there are really quite serious misalignments still uh, that, that need to be uh, taken care of if we want to advance, really. Um, last point is that in doing this, and it's been emphasized already, we should do this in awareness that not all parts of the world will in equal measure rely on price-based approaches. Uh, it will be very different. We talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, different emphasis, more a subsidy through the tax system type of, of approach. Other parts of the world rely more on regulation or, or on different types of subsidies. These differences are there. They're not very soon going to go away. We are, as I argued, actually moving in a, a direction of more diversity and heterogeneity in climate mitigation policy approaches. Um, that as such is not a problem. Adapting policies to local circumstances is a way to move forward. Uh, we need to make sure, however, that all of this combined results in uh, increased global effort. And that's what people have referred to this new OECD project, the Inclusive Forum on Carbon Mitigation Approaches, that is what that seeks to contribute to. Thank you very much, Kurt van Dender. And the final words with yourself, Gerasimus Thomas. I have said uh, a lot. I think uh, uh, we have a, t a package of proposals on the table. We have to get them uh, through. And I think uh, together with the Czech presidency and the member states and the European Parliament, I think we are encouraged that this first package of measures, the so-called Fit for 55, will get through. I think this uh, uh, navigates us from now to 2030 and adapted, you know, for the recent uh, uh, crisis. I think to get our, all our way to 2050, I would agree that we need to continuously uh, evaluate on uh, uh, where we want to, what role we want the tax system to play in this journey beyond 2030. 
uh, uh, I would agree with Christian that we need to uh, have the end vision, uh, you know, what is the tax system that uh, serves the green economy and work backwards. Uh, I agree that we need this uh, affordability and fairness to guide our transition uh, to there. And uh, that is why we, uh, despite the fact that we have made uh, concrete proposals on the table that they are very close to be adopted, we open also this debate through this forum and the tax symposium at the end of November to go then the step further and to design uh, the policies that we need in the next decade. Some of them uh, today we started with energy. Uh, the key idea is that by 2030, most of the energy transition will have to be completed. But I think to go all the way to 2050, uh, uh, we will need to change other parts of the economy. So climate transition uh, is only partly served by energy transition. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, particularly in the last decade, uh, uh, all of the change will be uh, through change of behavior. Um, you know, this decade we change our energy system. Next decade uh, we change uh, uh, a lot of our consumption partners. We finish with the transition of our energy. After 2040, it's only our behavior that can get us to 050, whether it is our eating habits, whether it is our urban planning, uh, whether it is our transportation mode. So be ready for big changes in our daily lives. Great. Thank you so much, Gerasimus Thomas. So all eyes now on the Czech presidency and then, of course, on the Swedish presidency who'll pick that up and hopefully get consensus as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Gerasimus Thomas there, the Director General of Taxations and Customs Union. Thanks so much as well to Kurt van Dender from the OECD for being here. Femke Grutus, thank you so much as well for all your interesting ideas and perspectives. And also to yourself, Christian Vallenduk. Thank you as well to all those here in the room with us and for your questions. And thanks to all those watching us online today. It's almost 5.30. Then you'll have the final section. That means you'll have the final section of Energy Sustainability Week or European Sustainable Energy Week. It will be concluded with an interview with uh, the Executive Vice President, Margaret Vestager, and the Director General of Energy, I believe. So do stick around for that. And then for the cocktail and networking opportunity a little bit later. But that's it from us. Thank you so much for your attention. Take care and see you soon.